anything, we may go ahead and get started. Um, thank you so much for being here today. I'm Katie Brown Johnson. Um, Happy New Year to, uh, I see many faces uh, that I know and some that I don't. So glad to welcome um, new folks and thank you always uh, for coming. Um, we are gonna hear uh, a really great presentation today. Um, I want to introduce um, Dr. Floyd and Dr. Guerin. So um, Dr. Floyd, the, who both come to us from uh, the Department of Pediatrics. Um, Dr. Floyd is a pediatrician and associate chair of diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. Um, great, thank you for muting. Um, and uh, she's also the director, the medical director of the Peninsula Family Advocacy Program, um, which is a medical legal partnership and a former member of the Dulce National Center Technical Assistance Team. Um, Dr. Guerin is a senior director of equity um, inclusion, uh, sorry, of education and diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice um, for the Department of Pediatrics. Um, and has been in that role since um, 2016. Um, and together, Dr. Floyd and Dr. Guerin um, co-direct the um, Stanford Pediatrics uh, Health Equity Advanced Through Learning, so the HEAL initiative. Um, and I know I, I see stuff from the HEAL initiative um, frequently. It's a, a multimodal educational initiative to foster um, uh, a department and clinical enterprise trained in anti-racism, um, empowered to apply learning to improve care and promoting an environment of continuous learning and improvement. So I wanna turn it over to this fabulous team um, and I'm excited to hear about centering DEI in our improvement work to advance health equity. Thanks so much for that introduction, Katie, and thanks so much for inviting us here to join you today. Um, as Katie mentioned, um, I'm Dr. Baraka Floyd, and I work at a federally qualified health center. Most of my work has been really focused on how we help healthcare teams screen for and address social determinants of health in family-centered ways, one of which use QI methodology, which I'll talk about, and others that use medical legal partnerships. I'm also the associate chair for DEI in our department, um, and co-direct the HEAL initiative with Dr. Guerin, um, and I'll pass it over to her to introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Um, as Katie mentioned, my name is Allison Guerin. My pronouns are she, her. I'm the Senior Director of Education and DEIJ in the Department of Pediatrics. Um, my work in the department has um, primarily been focused on supporting our education programs programs, including building new programs, um, and focused on how to create more opportunities for underrepresented in medicine applicants to pursue careers in science and medicine at Stanford and to feel a sense of belonging while here doing their training. Um, I've also had the pleasure of working with Dr. Floyd over the past two years in building out our diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice programming and support in the Department of Pediatrics. Okay, so we have no disclosures for you today, except that Dr. Guerin and I do not come to you as improvement experts. We are coming to share with you about the work that we're currently doing. We'll first start with a land acknowledgement, recognizing that Stanford sits on the ancestral land of the Wekma Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great significance to the Ohlone people and consistent with our values of community and inclusion. We have a responsibility to acknowledge, honor, and make visible the university's relationship to native people. We also wanna highlight and recognize the labor upon which our country, state, and institution are built. We remember that our country was built on the labor of enslaved folks that were kidnapped and brought to the US from Africa, an immigrant and indigenous labor that's voluntary, involuntary, trafficked, forced, undocumented, and all of these folks together contribute to building our country and labor in our workforce. We acknowledge these labor inequities and the shared responsibility for combating oppressive systems in our daily work. And so with that, today, We'll first begin with a case um, to illustrate the problem. We'll then dive a little bit deeper into key definitions and foundational concepts to highlight the current state, followed by two initiatives that serve as countermeasures 
um, in this scenario. So first, grounding in a family story. Anna is a 24-year-old Latina. Um, I'll note that I'm only naming her ethnicity here because we're going to be discussing how sociodemographics can be used to target work. She's a single mom who lives in a one-bedroom apartment with her seven-year-old daughter. She's gainfully employed in the cafeteria at a local elementary school, but despite this, she still is food insecure, meaning that she frequently has to worry about running out of food at the end of the month. What we know about Anna from our clinical encounters with her is just the tip of the iceberg. Anna has a strong support system. It allows her to work a second job because her neighbor and cousin, who's also a single mom, cares for her daughter while she works. She works a second job, not just to make ends meet, but to pay for a tutor for her daughter. And with this support, her daughter is getting straight A's. Anna is also paying for classes to learn English so she can better support herself and her children in the future. And both at work and in the community, Anna at times endures being spoken to loudly in English, even though raising the volume doesn't change the language. So some of us might be familiar with the idea that Anna didn't get here by accident or choice. Racism is a self-reinforcing system, but we often think of it in our personal terms, this box here over on the right, that's focused on stereotypes, biases, and stigma. These biases drove early historical injustices against enslaved Africans and indigenous people in the US, for example, and drives legal and economic forces that result in institutional racism, like redlining and segregation that leads to concentrated poverty. This results in generations down the road, families like Anna's not having equal opportunity to education and income, safe, affordable housing and wealth. And this reinforcing system results in families being in positions that are difficult to get out of. And so as we continue to illustrate the problem, I will pass it over to my colleague, Dr. Guerin. So we'd like to ground in some foundational concepts. So race is a social construct, not a biological construct. And racism, as defined by Dr. Kamara Jones, it's a system of structuring opportunity and oppression, and it assigns value based on the social interpretation of how one looks or someone's race. And what this does is it unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities while advantaging others. And the problem with racism is that it saps the strength of our whole society through the waste of human resources. And today we will focus on countermeasures aimed at building foundational knowledge providing venues to empower teams to tackle individual and local work to begin longitudinal work addressing racism at the top three levels on which racism exists. So racism exists on all four of these levels, and today we're going to focus on these top three. So systemic racism is often used synonymously with institutional racism. But the key difference here is that systemic racism is an overarching system of racial oppression across different institutions or society. So an example of systemic racism is a practice called redlining. And this is where discriminatory practices were used in lending um, in financial institutions. And this led to ripple effects in housing, education, employment, and criminal justice just to name a few different areas. Institutional racism are discriminatory practices based on socially assigned race of individual institutions. So an example of this might be hiring practices in an institution where they might bias towards or against certain individuals based on their race. And then interpersonal racism are expressions of racism between people. This is the most familiar definition that we might know of, of racism. Um, and examples of this range from implicit and explicit biases to racist jokes or racial slurs. And as we define diversity, think about what we know about Anna based on our vignette, we can consider the dimensions of diversity or human difference that we're aware of. And we can look at this wheel as an example of these different dimensions. So diversity can encompass many things, race and ethnicity just being one of those, age, gender, language, family, income, or appearance. Inclusion is the authentic and empowered participation with a true sense of belonging and full access to opportunities. And as we think about diversity and inclusion for our teams, it's really important to consider having diversity on our teams as diverse teams have been shown to perform better. 
we should ask, is everyone included? Should I yield my mic? And a good example of this is the launch of the first Apple Watch um, as an inclusion failure. So the Apple Watch at the time was this technological wonder that could measure the minutia of the human body, but they actually left out being able to measure women's menstrual cycles. And that was because no women were a part of the team that actually developed the first Apple Watch. So we'd like you to consider this giving tree on this graphic as the healthcare system. Um, and so we're going to define each of these terms um, on this tree. So inequality is the unequal access to opportunities. And the tree or the system, the healthcare system, is set up so it's bent to one side, making it impossible for the person on the right to get access to the apple that they need. Equality is evenly distributed tools and assistance. Everyone gets the same thing. The person on the right, though, still can't reach the apple that they need. Equity, each person has customized tools to address inequality, the tools that they need. Now each person can reach the, the apple that they need. But with justice, we're actually fixing the healthcare system to offer equal access to tools and opportunities. So you can see this combination of the two by fours and the strings to straighten the tree, and now everyone can get access to the apple that they need. And so by addressing this historical inequality, we can actually move towards justice. And ultimately, our goal is to move us towards anti-racism, to combat racist institutions and systems. And this really means confronting our own biases to stand up to racism perpetrated by others to combat it. For many people, this is the most difficult aspect of anti-racism because it can be challenging and uncomfortable to acknowledge how we as individuals are a part of racist systems. And so for an example, we can think of anti-racism as like moving on a walkway. So if we look at this example of authorship of papers, so if we look at a moving walkway, believing white authored papers are superior to other papers, this is someone who is actively racist. So if we think of this analogy of a moving walkway, someone who's actively racist is actually walking on the moving walkway, moving with the momentum of the walkway. Someone who is not racist would be someone who believes an author's race or ethnicity has no relation to the quality of the papers that are being submitted. Um, and you might think, well, isn't that what we are trying to achieve, um, that these things are unrelated? The problem being that we know that our institutions are racist, that our systems are racist. And so what's happening is while thinking these things are unrelated, we're still allowing our racist systems and institutions to be perpetrated. So we're stagnant on the moving walkway, we're allowing racism to continue. So what anti-racism looks like is actively highlighting papers written by people of color. So by being anti-racist and perpetrating anti-racism, we're moving against um, our inherently racist systems and structures, and we are actually moving against the moving walkway. So actively promoting anti-racism is important because we need to be taking action to remedy the systems that disadvantage people of color. So these efforts are all to advance health equity, which has many definitions. All definitions include a focus on ensuring opportunities for everyone to attain their highest level of health. And this includes screening for and addressing social determinants of health, language concordant care, and appropriate preventive care. And Stanford's health equity definition is health equity is realized when each individual has a fair opportunity to achieve their full potential. And as we work to define our problem, we have to consider that the patients and families we are doing this work for are, in reality, affected by the structural determinants of the social determinants of health. So we know that poverty and inequality drive health disparities, and this is why addressing social determinants of health is imperative. However, if we think back to the house that racism built example that Baraka showed earlier, Policies, economic systems, and social hierarchies drive poverty and inequality. So to truly impact health disparities and advance health equity, we need to begin to consider how these structures may impact different individuals and tailor our work accordingly. 
And this is using what's called a structurally humble lens or structural competency. And by doing this, we can then use structural determinants of the social determinants of health. So when we think about a current state analysis, what healthcare can do to address these structural determinants of the social determinants of health. So first, um, let's consider this photo on the left-hand side. So this is Highway 101 um, that maybe many of you have crossed over to get to um, Packard or to the Stanford campus today. So um, on the left-hand side of this photo is East Palo Alto. On the right-hand side is Palo Alto. So what you might notice is on the right-hand side, there are a lot of trees, um, significantly fewer on the left-hand side. This is not because there's different soil on one side or the other. This is purely because of a practice called redlining, which I had mentioned earlier. And redlining is a form of structural racism. The impacts of structural inequities stretch far and wide. If we're asking our healthcare system to give each patient what they need and to account for these structural inequities, we cannot follow a strict algorithm. We have to be flexible. In healthcare, we're faced with clinical uncertainty and the need to follow complex algorithms. But we often aren't equipped to provide structurally humble care to take into account these structures. However, communities know what they need, and they have the assets that we often forget to maximize. So listening to the lived experience of community partners like anti-poverty agencies, food banks, advocacy agencies, and the like provides us an avenue to provide tailored care. So the Stanford Pediatrics HEAL initiative or health equity advance through learning is a countermeasure to help combat health inequities by serving as a multimodal anti-racism educational initiative whose aims are to foster a department and clinical enterprise that is trained in anti-racism concepts, empowered to apply learnings to advance health equity, and promotes an environment of continuous learning and improvement. So this is an initiative that Baraka and I co-direct um, in the Department of Pediatrics, as well as across um, Stanford Children's Health. Um, and this initiative includes three components, the HEAL Seminar, which is an educational workshop on foundational diversity, equity, inclusion concepts. In FY22, we focused on anti-racism. This year, we are focused on gender and microaggressions. Um, it also includes huddle guides, um, which are one-page resource guides to distill the concepts from the HEAL Seminar into bite-sized materials for clinical teams and health equity rounds, um, which are multidisciplinary case-based round discussions to highlight the role of bias in patient care and to provide individual and local improvement opportunities. Um, and this is really designed to be a continuum of opportunities through multimodal education um, and foundational venues to apply these concepts. Our anti-racism seminar was really designed to be foundational knowledge on structural racism, medical racism, microaggressions, and allyship. We um, delivered this to our Department of Pediatrics faculty, staff, and trainees, and our facilitators were our own faculty and staff, um, both junior and senior faculty and staff. Our outcomes were that overall we were effective in increasing our participants' knowledge of these foundational concepts and three months after they completed the seminar, participants continued to use the information learned in their practice. And over the course of the year, we were able to train over a thousand people in this seminar. Our health equity rounds um, sessions, we um, found that 98% of our participants felt like they learned something that would change their practice through these discussions. And we were able to provide individual level tools to um, participants to help them change their practice after the session. Um, in this chart here, you can see the different topics that were addressed in the health equity rounds discussions and the different divisions that participated in FY22. And across the different health equity rounds sessions that we led um, with the faculty leads listed here, um, they really taught us the importance of equity revisions and to assure that the improvement work we do is not exacerbating the current disparities that exist but are driven by the identified disparities through these discussions. And then finally, huddle guides. 
um, are designed to ensure that teams and frontline staff in the hospital have a baseline understanding of diversity, equity, inclusion, and health equity. And by distilling concepts from our anti-racism seminar into bite-sized training materials, we're able to use the LPCH daily management system in order to deliver this content to frontline staff. Um, so these are being piloted here in the Johnson Center at LPCH. And then after piloting, we'll be rolling this out in a staggered fashion throughout the entire hospital. Um, and this meets the Respect for People core goal, um, which is an LPCH-wide incentive across the hospital. Um, so we'll be able to engage many stakeholders um, in this initiative. And now I'll pass it back to Braca. All right, so we're gonna go back to our case. Anna unfortunately went into preterm labor and while her baby's in the NICU, instead of being able to focus on bonding with her baby, she's worried about losing her job and her housing while baby's in the hospital. She wasn't expecting to be out so soon. And in our theoretical scenario, this baby happens to be born in a hospital that's doing a lot of what Dr. Guerin suggested. They're targeting identified disparities in patients speaking languages other than English and have started robust targeted work to address them. However, we're gonna focus on what happens after discharge when Leah goes home at one week old. Dulce is a systematic, uh, apologies. Um, so one of the things that I think is sometimes hard is that theorizing what an improvement initiative would look like that's grounded in racism can be hard. Um, so fortunately, Dulce exists. And this is a systematic approach to whole health that accounts for structural inequities. So we'll let the video tell us what Dulce is about. Welcoming a new baby is joyful. It can also be stressful. Racist and inequitable systems make it hard for families to access resources like food or stable housing and figure out a confusing healthcare system. Dulce can help. How? A family with a newborn is supported by a family specialist on their parenting journey and is connected to the resources they need. The family specialist identifies needs alongside the family, like housing, food, or mental health, and then collaborates with an interdisciplinary team to come up with solutions. The family specialist offers solutions directly to the family who decides what's best for them. Navigating these systems alongside families lowers their stress and gives them more time and energy for their baby. Families graduate from Dulce with more resources and more confidence navigating the health system. Hooray! To learn more, email dulce at cssp.org. You're muted. I'm on mute. Um, DULCE is an acronym for Developmental Understanding and Legal Collaboration for Everyone. The DULCE approach actually grew out of a successful randomized control trial that used a multidisciplinary team in a primary care clinic and showed decreased ED visits, increased on-time well-child visits, and faster access to concrete supports like food stamps that this family needs. It uses quality improvement to implement DULCE in clinics across the country. And so the first cohort included seven communities across California, Florida, and Vermont, then three additional communities in these states. One of the key things that was important here is the family specialist. The family specialist is a paraprofessional, essentially a community health worker with additional training around development. In this team structure, the family specialist the medical provider who's an MD or a nurse practitioner, a mental health representative, an early childhood representative, the legal partner and clinic administrator work together to sit down and discuss how to address each family's unique needs. Additionally, they consider some of the systemic barriers that are placed for our families based on the existence of structural racism. One key thing about this team is that the family specialist comes from the local community in which the clinic sit both bringing in their own lived experience and their knowledge of the local community. And then this inclusive team structure, the family specialist voice carries just as much weight as the other team members. And I'll talk about a couple of key areas where our family specialist insights really changed the way that we decided to implement this intervention. On the next slide, we highlight my, doc, my colleague, Dr. Mary Catherine Arbor's work who leads our quality improvement work in this area. 
The first arrow highlights in September 2018, where our national team met with these new local teams to create process maps to identify what are the resources available to address social determinants of health, who would be responsible for screening, and who would provide resources and follow-up. Between the months of November through April, monthly CQI coaching for these teams took place with PDSA testing, allowing each team to tailor this intervention to their local context. And during this time, I'll highlight that we met a new average of 89.9% .9 of families being screened. In May 2019, we came back together for another meeting to share out our learnings and additional PDSAs. And then between August and November, two of our sites began electronic health records supported social determinants of health screening and resource provision without a change in baseline with the support of this national team. So what's unique about Dulce is what we measured. So in blue is the families who were screened, the number and percent, and red is the percentage of those families who screened positive who received resources, and then in green is the families who were using resources at the end of Dulce. We measured that a resource was being actively used at the end of the intervention, as this indicates what's working for a family. This change wasn't based on our expertise as physicians or quality improvement experts. It was based on the expertise of the family specialist who recognized that many families came to Dulce already using some resources, sometimes declined resources for various reasons, and they needed time and support to connect with and begin to use resources. It also measures for us as healthcare teams what we want to see, that needs are being met and that families can navigate these systems. Similarly, we screen for maternal depression and intimate partner violence. And as you can see here, we continue to measure resource connection at the end of the six month intervention of Dulce. And you see similarly high rates of connection here as well. So to conclude what this could look like for Anna and Leah, they joined Dulce and they're connected with all of these things listed on the screen. Through the support of this multidisciplinary team, this cross-sector team worked together and centered the perspectives of the family specialists to drive the intervention to meet the needs of the local community. And so we query what could have happened to Anna and Leah without these interventions, without a foundational understanding of the structures that drive poverty and inequality and negative health outcomes. And being able to pull together an inclusive team, taking into account the knowledge that we have about our local community and the lived experience of our team members. So we'll conclude with some take home points. First is knowledge is power. When we educate ourselves, we have to consider that we're all working within an equitable systems. As we highlighted in our labor acknowledgement, the inequities that are in our system have been there for years. And so effective learning really requires us to utilize multiple modalities and engage in continuous learning. We can't understand these inequities to start to impact them through one lecture. We also need to remain humble to engage in that continuous learning and implement strategies to achieve diversity, equity, and inclusion on our teams to avoid missing critical improvement opportunities. Thinking about, should I yield my mic? Should someone else be speaking now? Continuous humility also is important for us to learn about our local historical context and diversity, equity, and inclusion in our work. We have to understand and apply these foundational concepts to collect robust demographic data in order for us to disaggregate it and identify and address disparities because we're past identifying disparities now. We've been doing that for years. To maximize our impact, Within our healthcare system, we need to maximize multidisciplinary partnerships within our team. Each of us has something to teach and each of us has something to learn. But important in this is listening to the voices closest to those experiencing inequities and amplifying them when you can. When considering representation on your teams, one person isn't enough. You need critical mass. We can't expect one single person to respect to um, represents the perspectives of an entire community. Finally, achieving health equity is going to require us to measure what matters, that those within our systems are getting what they need. To do this, we need to tailor care to account for structural inequities outside our walls. 
we need to consider and address the policies and procedures within our institutions that continue to create labor inequities. Cross-sector partners in our communities are well suited to help us with this, but we have to listen to their lived experience and expertise. This may require us to slow down. It might require us to invest and work differently than we're accustomed to, but together we can move towards equity and justice. And so with that, we'll end with this quote that if we wanna walk fast, we'll walk alone. But if we wanna walk far, we'll walk with others. And I encourage us when we're thinking about others to think about others broadly, um, others in the community inside and outside of our walls. Here are our references and thank you so much for your time. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Floyd and Garen. And um, if you're at a place where you can come off mute, I'd love uh, for us to give a round of applause. Or you can just, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Lisa just put in the chat, if you're not already a member, please join um, the Stanford Medicine Center for Improvement. I'm also pointing you to the chat because um, I'm happy for people to raise hands and ask questions, or if you want to jump in, I'm, I'm facilitating the chat as well. Um, I just say, I don't, I don't know about y'all, but I, I found this um, talk really impactful and very useful. Um, there was literally a lightning strike by my house as Dr. Guerin introduced uh, structurally humble care, which I, is a concept that I, I hadn't, I missed along the way I hadn't heard of before. So I'm, I'm, I'm taking notes uh, from the weather that uh, there's, I, I've got some good work to do in terms of, um, in terms of building my knowledge um, and experience in this space. Um, and so I'd, I'd love to open it to questions. Um, and in the meantime, I, since I'm, since I'm here and talking, uh, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the legal partnership. I mean, just diving in a bit um, to Dulce. Um, and in particular, so one of my best friends is involved in a legal healthcare partnership um, in Berkeley. And um, the, the funding piece is super challenging because it doesn't fit into the boxes that, um, that we currently have. So I'm, I'm wondering if you can comment on that and just tell us more about the legal partnership, because that's kind of a, a new concept, at least for me in healthcare. So the way that our legal part, I'll step back and talk about how our legal partners functioned. The way our legal partners functioned in Dulce was when concrete supports issues or social determinants of health issues came up. And let's say for a family like Anna and Leah's, there were barriers to actually getting to the important resources that they needed really examining what are the barriers in the way. So are we following policy and procedure according to the letter of law? This isn't for the legal partner to sue, but the legal partner provides education and information to the family specialist that they can provide to the family for the family to navigate. So this might look like a family being told, actually your food stamps should not have been cut off. This is something that you can contest. And if the family desires or needs support in doing this, that family would then be referred over to Katie, like what your friend works in, a medical legal partnership. One of the challenges with Dulce um, for our legal partners has been funding because for most medical legal partnerships, a lot of the funding comes from taking cases. And in this construct, we are not opening cases for these families. We're providing families with the robust information about their legal rights, risks, and remedies for them to navigate these systems in the future. So that if Anna and Leah's food stamps get disconnected later, they'll know this is wrong, I need to contest this. Or for example, if there are issues with family law, helping the family understand what um, their rights and remedies are there. Does that help Katie? Yeah, that's super interesting. And that actually wasn't what I was thinking the model was. So it's um, it's super useful to understand that it's a little, perhaps a little more education about uh, the potential legal issues. Um, so I, other, I appreciate that. Um, the other layer that I'll highlight is as this Dulce team was together and has this robust data in front of them, they were able to start to see patterns. 
So in some of our systems, we were able to see that infants were not being enrolled in Medicaid um, quickly as they were supposed to be. And so our legal partner was able to advocate with local Medi-Cal and with that work with the hospital in order to get babies signed up for insurance so that that's not a barrier to care in the future. Um, and so when these patterns of issues started to come up, there is still an opportunity for our legal partners to either sue if is necessary or to provide some advocacy to break down some of those structural barriers, which is really where taking those structural inequities into account. Super interesting. Thank you so much for diving in. Um, and we're just getting nice uh, comments in the chat. Uh, Catherine Lowry says, thank you for the work you're doing and great presentation. Um, Betsy, you had asked about the huddle guides and a, a link. Um, do you want to chime in? And I, I had put just some things that I could find uh, broadly, um, but Baraka, um, Betsy, I'd, um, uh, Allison, I'd, I'd invite you to, to comment if, um, if there's a, a better place to find those uh, resources. So our huddle guides are still being piloted. Um, so as we go through the pilot process with our colleagues in the Johnson Center, um, much thanks um, to the Johnson Center team with Nassim Delavery, um, Cheryl Goldstein, um, Luann Smedley, and um, Jermaine, um, whose name I just suddenly forgot. Um, there, um, there we're piloting there and those will then be disseminated after that. Um, and at that point, um, we would be able to make them available um, for our local folks within um, Stanford Medicine Children's Health. Allison, anything to add? Yeah, no, I think that's, that's where we're at at this point. Um, so more to come, but I think Betsy, I'm not sure which team you're a part of, but I would say if you're group is one that wants to be kind of next on the pilot group. We'd love to talk to you about that um, and get you on the next list as a group we could pilot with next after the Johnson Center. Yeah, um, I'm with our suspected child abuse and neglect team with Dr. Aggie and Dr. Stewart. So I definitely think that there's uh, opportunities for collaboration in the future. Okay, great. And I'll, I'll put um, everybody's contact information, or at least uh, Dr. Floyd and Garen's contact information in the chat shortly. Um, uh, did you unmute to chime in, Dr. Floyd? No. Okay. No. Uh, great. I, I, I love um, Yvette Torres' question. Um, there's a lot of health equity work going on. Um, at, across SHC. Is there a process set up to share information across? all the SHC organization. Uh, this is definitely a question that I have and feel like I ask on a regular basis. Uh, there are just so many things going on in the space of health equity um, and I try to keep up. But I, I, I wonder, and this might be a question that, that um, you know, uh, Dr. Floyd, Dr. Guerin, you might know, or if someone else in the audience knows um, about a centralized location for this. Um, I think it's great. Of course, Stanford does, you know, the thousand flowers. It's great that it's happening all over the place. Um, and it would be really fantastic to know, uh, you know, where to go across the, the organization. Any, any thoughts or does anybody have any information about an initiative headed that direction? Awesome. I have my work cut out for me. Yes. We have our work cut out for us. Um, I will highlight that um, after the Commission on Justice and Equity, there were um, APWs or alignment planning work groups um, that started to put together some recommendations around DEI education and standards. Um, and trying to help centralize some of these things. So the anticipation for my understanding is that those things will be coming down the pike in terms of how to share and how to align. Um, I, uh, I've heard there's a question from Dr. Marcy Winget. Would you like to unmute? Yes, hello. Um, wow, what a fantastic presentation. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, I have a question about um, the outcomes, which of course are exactly the outcomes that should be measured. 
But one of the reasons that they so often aren't is because the complete lack of systems in place to assess closed loop referrals. And so I'd love to hear um, kind of uh, how you guys uh, have addressed that so successfully. Um, I can speak to what was done in Dulce, um, as Dulce is not happening here locally at our, in our system. Um, so for Dulce, they did create a data registry um, where the community health workers input that information. So followed up with families and very clearly documented whether or not a family had a need, whether or not a family desired support for said need, and then whether or not a resource was given. And then based on our process maps, we then come back to families right before that six month visit so that we understand where they are in order to provide a, a handoff essentially to the pediatrician because they'll now be going back to regular pediatric care um, without the Dulce interdisciplinary team. Um, ways that the teams locally got past a lot of the information sharing, um, some teams were able to build closed loop referral systems um, with local food banks or other groups, um, which is something that we um, have piloted here um, at Stanford Medicine Children's Health and at my clinic, um, Gardner Packard, where we send direct referrals over to Second Harvest Food Bank with the permission of the parents. And then that person from Second Harvest Food Bank then contacts the family to understand what the needs are um, and provide resources from there. It also allows for the pulling of an analytical report for us to understand who Second Harvest was able to get in touch with and who they weren't. Um, but I'll be frank, it took a lot of time um, for our teams on the ground to be able to build these closed loop referral systems. Um, and the family specialist was very key in making sure that while we awaited closed loop referral systems where we could get them, which were usually in the domain of food, um, it really took the human work power of our family specialists to do that follow-up and confirm with families where things were. Is that helpful, Marcy? Yeah, no, that's great. And I just wanted to share, um, I'm actually uh, uh, on a Robert Wood Johnson um, funded project that the uh, partners we're working with have developed a closed loop system using uh, Unitis as the platform. There's several different platforms out there, but I would love Stanford to actually get on board with um, one of those platforms like that. I think that could just really take Stanford to the, to the next level. So just planting a seed, but uh, it's, it's, it's great, great to see this. We are, so at, much. yes, I agree with you. I'll leave it there. <laughs> I didn't mean to cut you off. I think um, we've got uh, time for one or two more questions. And I, I know um, in the background, um, just circling back to where, um, you know, where this is all kind of coming together, the health equity and inclusion work is coming together within the organization. Um, Blaze Bush, who is our new executive director of, and I will let Blaze tell you, um, uh, pointed me to uh, We Ask Because We Care. So Blaze, I'm punching to you for a moment. Thanks, and thank you so much. Love Baraka and Allison's work, and always been a fan for a long time. So thank y'all for speaking today. So um, just on great initiatives that you're leading. Um, I had reached out to Katie because I had caught some of that question about enterprise-wide initiatives. And, um, you know, We Ask Because We Care has gone through a phase one on uh, real, which was race, ethnicity, and language. And we are kicking off phase two, which is sexual orientation, gender identity collection across the entire enterprise. And to make sure both, like all of our systems are aligned in the way that we collect this and hopefully then communicate it as well. Um, and of course, there's going to be quite a bit of training that rolls out across the entire system as it relates to how do we ask somebody's gender identity, sexual orientation, how do we have those conversations with patients, you know, from billing all the, you know, to, to front desk, to providers in every aspect of our healthcare system. So that should be rolling out over the course of this next year. Fantastic. Um, and uh, any other questions? 
I don't know about you guys, but it is actually a maelstrom over here uh, right now. So um, multiple lightning strikes. Um, Dr. Floyd, Dr. Guerin, would you like to uh, chime in before we close out today? Um, I'm just going to build on what Blaze shared about We Ask Because We Care in that um, by collecting the sociodemographic information, it really will provide us with better tools for us to be able to identify and address disparities um, in a much better way so that we actually know who are the people experiencing inequities, where might they be, and how can we get to them. Um, and then in addition, um, with the educational materials that are provided, that foundational information allows us to implement this work um, in a much more robust way. Fantastic. Well, thank you again, Dr. Guerin, Dr. Floyd, um, for, uh, for your fantastic presentation today. I'll just send everybody back to the chat again for links to SMCI, um, I added some links to Dulce and to Heal, and um, I'm just really excited to kick off uh, 2023 with you all and look forward to seeing you next time. Anything else, Lisa, or? Um... Just, just the bar has been set very high for participation, um, Baraka and Allison, so uh, you, just, you just threw down big time. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, hope to get the same kind of attendance in uh, two weeks. Hope everybody can join us again. Thank you, Katie. Thank you for having Thank us. Thank you all so much. For having Have us. an excellent day. I would, I would say stay dry, but I don't know if that's possible. Stay safe. Thank you. Take care. Okay.